As always, it's a pleasure to be before you to deliver these sermons, or at least what I'd like to call sermons. If you would like to follow along, this morning's text will come from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Again, that's Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Now from this text, and we will read that shortly, we find a man that was quite wealthy as far as this world is concerned. No doubt this, this man was considered profitable and given high esteem in the eyes of his peers. And more than likely, given the results that he was able to obtain, he was quite skilled and wise in both business and management. Yet, as we will find, he was lacking in the most important aspect of not only his life, but everyone's lives. So our text, again Luke 12, beginning in verse 13 said, And one of the companies said unto him, that is Jesus, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Now as we have seen, this man was able to gain many things in his life on the earth. However, God gives him a very specific title. God calls this man a fool. Here this term means witless mindless, egotistic, rash, or unwise. This is potent language, but God uses it nonetheless to describe this rich man. And as we will soon study where this man went wrong and how then we can learn from him. From the first few verses of our text, We see that not only this rich man, but also the brother mentioned, had a foolish sense of value, specifically verse 15. But you look at the brother who's fighting over the inheritance. How many times do you know of within the families, after a particular loved one has has died, that they start fighting over all the stuff that that individual was able to obtain? I want this, I want that, It's give this to me. They told me I could have it. They might have. But consider what just happened. And this, taking this stuff, these goods, is more important to you than providing for the needs of this family who has just lost this, lost this loved one of which they're part of. Either way, it appears that the goal of this rich man was to accumulate riches in this life. 
Jesus gave the following warning. Again, we'll read verse 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And I would add that, that could be great or small. But how many people today actually heed this warning? Instead, the masses equate success to material wealth. Jesus dealt with young men that, dis, that actually subscribed to this view. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 24. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 25. Mark chapter 18, verses 18 through 25. As well as Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 25. As we see from these passages, many today have a similar reaction. When, pointed the, when the truth is pointed out to them, they leave sorrowful. They leave upset. They leave disheartened. Because they're told that their wealth, their riches, is not actually what is important in this life. Now, we would point out that obtaining and maintaining wealth in this life is not inherently sinful. However, making it one's life goal to obtain such riches for the sake of being rich is in, indeed greedy or covetousness, which is exactly what Christ was warning against. Now contrast this with what is expected of the Christian, found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. There the inspired Paul writes, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us there be, or therewith be content. But they which will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Many today would point to that verse, specifically dealing with money, and say money is evil. Well, folks, money is simply a tool. The verse actually says the love of money. And that's the key. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, not the, the money itself. Those who will to be rich fall into the temptation. Verse 9. Also, part of laying hold on eternal life is being content with the necessities that we possess. And certainly would be content with those luxuries that we possess as well. Those things that go beyond what we simply need, but they're excess. What attitude should we have toward the riches that we possess? Paul tells the, the elders at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verses 32 through 35, Brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel, Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities, and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. We know from our text that this particular attitude was not exhibited by the rich man. He had a wrong sense of value regarding material wealth 
and even the worth of his own immortal soul. And certainly he would have a wrong view of the mortal souls of others. Jesus poses a question regarding the worth of the soul. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, as well as Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. That passage reads, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The answer, ultimately and obviously, is nothing. We must never forget this concept. However, our rich man obviously did. One soul is worth so much more than what this world can offer and ever could offer. Consider Proverbs chapter 13, verses 7 through 9. There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great, great riches. The ransom of a man's life are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. The light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. If all you're looking for in this life is what you can gain, your goal is wrong. You're following after the rich fool of our text. You have a wrong sense of value. <clears throat> Secondly, we consider that our rich fool had a foolish sense of ownership, as found in verses 16 through 18 of our text. We see that this rich man thought himself to be the sole owner of his goods. Again, our text, Luke 12, 16, 17, and 18. Jesus saying, the, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. I see signs somewhere in, in workplaces, and I've, I'm obviously guilty of it myself, although that, that isn't the actual goal that I'm going by. It's, of course I talk to myself. I want expert advice. I just do it because I might be a little off my rocker. It's just how I think. Sometimes it's out loud. But this rich man consults himself about how to proceed in handling his own goods. In the verses that we considered, there are 11 personal pronouns to describe these goods. They're all his. But he's seeking inward advice. For a much bigger issue. Obviously this rich fool. Was not mindful. Perhaps he forgot. Proverbs chapter 16. Verses 18 and 19. Pride or arrogance. Goeth before destruction. And a haughty spirit. Before a fall. Better it is to be an humble spirit. With the lowly. Than to divide the spoil. With the proud. This man is guilty of fundamentally mistaking himself for Jehovah God. This rich man thought his houses, barns, lands, and the very crops that were able to be produced were his possessions alone. Instead, we find that his material wealth possessed this rich man. How many are there today that are guilty of this very same thing? This same error. Now again, is it sinful to own or possess material wealth in any form? Not at all. We have the right to own many things. We can see this in the account of Ananias and Sapphira. There in Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 4. There it reads, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession 
So they legally owned a possession. But that's not necessarily what we're concerned about. And kept back part of the, the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back a part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in that heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Not only are we legally able to own certain things, but this is an acceptable thing before God. You see, this couple, this married couple, had the authority to own this possession. They also had the authority to possess the money that they received for the sale of that possession. The problem arose here is they wanted all the pomp and proceed that went along with selling this property for whatever they said it was. But in reality, they kept back a little bit. So they lied about it. They lied about how much they sold it for. But nonetheless, we have the ability, the authority to own things in this life. So that's not the problem. There is a certain level of control that is expected with the possessions that we have. We see from Ananias and Sapphira, as well as our rich fool, that they were guilty of being foolish with their goods. Now we're told in Psalm 24 verse 1, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Furthermore, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4 says, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Thus it can be properly stated that God is the rightful owner of all things in existence. Because of this, man is simply a steward. Man is an overseer. Man is a manager. This term steward also covers being a fiscal agent, which is a treasurer of any given blessing. How are we conducting ourselves as stewards? We see how the rich, foolish man conducted himself, and he was condemned for it. Thus, he is not an example that we must be following. Stewards are expected to be faithful in discharging their obligations. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. Luke chapter 12, verses 42 through 44. And 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Being a godly steward is even a qualification for elders. Titus chapter 1, verse 7. As we read earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, we brought nothing into this world. And we will leave this world with nothing. You never see a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it. And even if you do... What good is it going to serve? Absolutely nothing. You have passed on from this material world. Thus the riches you may or may not have obtained in this life, they're still here. Thus we must handle the blessings that God has given each and every one of us with great discretion and proper respect and ultimately using them for His good and glory. We see that our foolish rich man was guilty of this, for he fell short in these areas. Third, we see that this rich foolish man was foolish in his hope for happiness. Verse 19 of our text. We see that this, this rich fool thought that his material wealth brought him happiness. Again, verse 19 says, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, 
eat, drink, and be merry. This man sought peace in all of his grain, in all of his gold, perhaps his silver, in his material wealth, rather than finding peace and happiness with God. Well, how much is the much listed here? I don't know. But as been said by some, more than a little. Either way, this points to the fact that this foolish rich man had many goods or sustenance and ease for several years ahead of his life. So obviously, he was quite a successful businessman and successful in managing the goods that he did possess. It's not just one thing to obtain all the great wealth. It's something else entirely to keep it, to be able to make sure that you're able to hold on to it. Many people can spend a million dollars in a couple days. It takes a good bit of discipline to hang on to that, to manage that money properly. This man evidently knew what he was doing, at least in that regard. But he took it to the next level by relying on the principles, or these principles, that is, his material wealth, for his own happiness. Again, turning to Proverbs, he did not heed the warning here found in chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard, when thou wilt arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. It is quite evident that this rich man worked very hard for the things that he possessed. Yet we find him slipping into a state of laziness. Think about the ant and its cycle of harvesting, cycle for working. Ants have no guide. They don't have a ruler telling them how to act, how to provide for the colony. It's something that they do. They provide for their own. On the contrary, this rich fool had a guide. That's Jehovah God. And unfortunately for this foolish man, he chose to ignore his guide. And the end result is painful and even violent death, which is exactly what this man found out. We see that Jesus dealt with some of his followers who were guilty of this very same thing. In John chapter 6, we see him convicting those who followed him of being guilty for following him specifically to gain the food that he provided those who were weary. In effect, these followers were nothing more than mercenaries. You provide us the necessities and we'll follow you. In John chapter 6, verses 26 and 27, says, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now here's the key. Labor not for that meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Clearly, these individuals had impure motives for following the Savior. Jesus gave them the proper goal which to seek after, and that is to obtain that meat, does, that which does not perish. He proclaims in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Thus Jesus will provide for our necessities. We will never want if we are indeed faithful to him. 
Now this obviously is not physical in nature. This is spiritual. But we'll, cons we'll consider further this, these points shortly. Now adding to this, John chapter 6, verse 63, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Now couple these with John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus says there that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the only way to our Heavenly Father. Jesus brings true nourishment to our spiritual needs. This is found in the words which He has spoken. We have His word recorded for us in the New Testament. Thus, Romans chapter 10 verse 17 is true. For indeed faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. With these things in mind, we must consider the proper place of working for our income. It is the case that we must financially provide for ourselves and our families. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10 and 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. However, this must not be where our happiness derives. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain, not that great promotion at work. How we use, again, how we use our wealth says much more about our character. Do we believe the words of our Lord in Acts chapter 20, verse 35? Is it indeed more blessed to give than to receive? Do we acknowledge our obligations as Christians from Galatians chapter 6, verse 10? Do we actually do good unto the household of faith and all others who are indeed our neighbors? With great or greater wealth comes the greater opportunity to discharge the, uh, these obligations. The foolish rich man of our text chose to allow his riches to be the source of his happiness. Instead, why don't we use our riches to do good things and bring about true happiness? We do not have to fall into the same trap as this foolish rich man did. And fourth, we note from our text that this rich man had a foolish sense of of security. Verse 20. This rich man took refuge in the material wealth that he possessed. Yet we see the conclusion of that. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose things shall those things be? Or then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? You might be highly esteemed among your peers. You were able to collect this amount of wealth. But now that your soul is required, who's going to get those? Well, that might lead to the two brothers mentioned earlier in our text. Make sure my brother splits the inheritance with me. Now you have people fighting over the goods that you spent most of your life trying to obtain. As this foolish rich man found out, this was a great folly. That is to have or seek out and find security in his material wealth. He thought safety and security would come from those things which he possessed. The grain, the fruits, the goods. Yet he was sorely mistaken. Because of this ill-prepared attitude, God gave him a very specific label. God called him mindless, rash, and unwise. God called this man a fool. We find this principle in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 11. As the partridge sitteth on eggs, and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches, and not by right, 
shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. This is basically the Hebrew word that's compatible with the Greek term that we've defined this morning. At his end he shall be unwise, mindless, egotistic. It is not inherently sinful to plan for one's future needs. However, the wise must realize and often do that they may never be able to fulfill such plans. Apparently, this rich man had forgotten that he was a mortal. As such, he failed to remember God in his future. How then would the wise person conduct their life? Well, those who would be wise would be mindful of God's advice. We turn to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 28 and, or 27 and 28. He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Consider also James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. There it points out that our life is a vapor. It's here now, but it quickly vanishes away. We must look to the godly examples of old, such as Abraham. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 through 10, says of him, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. You know, Abraham was a very wealthy individual. However, we don't find him being called a fool by God. He had the proper outlook on his material wealth. He looked for a city with foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Thus, if we are to seek true security, we must look past the riches that this life in the flesh has to offer. Instead, we must seek after God and be obedient to Him. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24 outline this very well. Instead of building up treasures on earth, we should be working to build treasures up in heaven. And he later points out that we cannot serve God in riches or mammon. Now taking this entire chapter, is it a, co a coincidence that we find this command just before the promise that God gives to us? If we seek and serve Him, all of our material needs, not wants, but needs will be taken care of. If we indeed serve God, He will take care of us. We might not understand, and most often we don't understand how. That's not our, our issue to deal with. He has promised He will take care of us. And that just needs to be it as far as what we're concerned with, outside of being faithful to Him. Now, with each of these points in mind, we come to a scriptural conclusion. Luke chapter 12, verse 21 the fool that layeth up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. Jesus points this out. What a terrible thing it is to be labeled foolish by God. Yet yeah, this is the exact term that the Holy Spirit used, that Jesus used to describe this obedient rich man, this disobedient rich man. Now you can choose to be his servant, that is God's servant today, and thereby escaping the same end which this foolish rich man found, that is torment. We do have that choice. Just as he had the same choice 
to go into those evil things, we have the same choice to escape them, to escape that type of thinking and behavior. We know many of those around us are concerned with consuming and laying up treasure for their own years of retirement, which again, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But when that becomes your life goal, we've crossed a line. Now, keep in mind that many, if not most, companies today offer a, some form of retirement fund, which allows their employees to contribute money from their checks to set aside for their retirement. Now, in order to, qual to qualify for such an option, for such an account, they put certain qualifications in place. First and foremost, you have to actually be an employee of that company. The 401k is not offered to just anyone. You have to be an employee of that company to make full benefit of that. Now, what kind of spiritual treasures are you laying by in store? In order to properly qualify for laying up treasures in heaven, you must become a child of God, a member of the body of Christ, that is, a New Testament Christian. This is accomplished by obeying the gospel of Christ. We typically refer to this as the plan of salvation. Believing in Jesus as the very Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing Him before others, and finally being baptized for the mission of your sins. Upon meeting these qualifications, you're now able to contribute of your means, that is spiritual means, putting treasures in heaven. You must also live faithfully to God, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Only at that point do you have the hope of heaven when this life in the flesh is over. Now, perhaps you have already become a Christian. And yet, through weakness, you've allowed sin back into your life, and you've, been, and you've fallen. Why not take care of that today? Why not repent, confess, and through prayer be restored? Do not follow the foolish example of the rich man in our text. We are not guaranteed another moment upon this earth. Do not be foolish today. If either of these needs apply to you, make it known as together we stand and sing.